Hello everyone, this week we're going to be looking at London by William Blake, which is the second um, poem in the Power and Conflict anthology. So first of all, I'm just going to read through the poem so that we've all got a sense of what it is about before we start talking about Blake and the context surrounding him and the writing of this poem. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blast the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. OK, so that is um, the first reading of London by William Blake. And um, it's kind of his hymn to the city that he grew up in and how he sees it now as an adult. Um, so I'll just just go across here to the context part of the lesson which is what we're going to be focusing on today um the context of william blake's life and some of the historical events that influenced his um his life and writing so this is blake himself uh, that's a portrait painted of him um in his early 50s um he was born in 1757 and he died in 1827 so he lived a bit of a longer life um, than our last poet, but he's he's just as interesting. So his childhood, let's have a think about that. So he was one of, oh no, that's not right. He was one of seven children. Two of his siblings died in infancy. So he's part of a big family and he grew up in relative poverty compared with, um, compared with our last poet. So he's not as much part of the establishment um, he's, he's a very interesting child. So from a very early age, he sees religious visions. So at the age of four, he sees God put his head to his face to the window. And at the age of nine, he sees a tree full of angels. And that's in the middle of London because Blake grew up in London and lived in the family home in Soho until he was 25. So his parents were kind of aware that he was a bit of an interesting child. He wasn't quite. Um, he wasn't quite what they would call, have called normal at that time. So he was homeschooled. Um, he did go to school until the age of 10. But beyond that, he um, learned at home under the guidance of his mother. He didn't really attend uh, a normal school and institution. So there are some key landmarks from his childhood here, which kind of like show us his developing passions. So age 10, Blake decides he wants to be a painter. And he maintains his interest in painting and art throughout his life. And he's a very talented watercolorist. And you can have a Google of some of his paintings. They're quite, um, there's a lot of religious imagery in them. He had an, an exhibition um, in his adulthood. And a lot of people, critics, sort of thought his paintings were a bit mad. They thought he, they showed him to be a little bit mad. At the age of 12, Blake begins to write poetry. Um, at the age of 14, he is apprenticed to an engraver. So that's um, somebody who creates illustrations for books. So back in that time, they would have had to have engraved an illustration onto a metal plate and then printed it onto the book. And that was what Blake was apprenticed to do. Um, he, does, he does that because to go to art school at that time was too expensive. So it's kind of like... Um, a compromise like he wanted to be an artist but he there wasn't the money to send him to art school so he became apprentice to, to an engraver okay so that's sort of a whistle-stop tour of Blake's childhood so as you can see his passions for painting for poetry and for engraving are developing all the way back in his childhood so from age 10 the man that Blake becomes as an adult is very clear I'm just going to show you also um this which is an illuminated copy of London now illumination is um what Blake was practicing when he was apprenticed to the engraver 
So this is what he was looking to achieve. And all of his poems from Songs of Innocence and Experience, which we'll talk about later, are illuminated in this way. So London, the poem we've just looked at, there's these illustrations here of an old man and a little boy. And I can't quite make out that one, but we'll have a look at that in more detail tomorrow. But Blake illustrated all of his poems. And so his passion for art and for um engraving was kind of combined with his his passion for poetry later on in his life so later in his adult life in 1782 blake gets married to an illiterate woman named catherine boucher who becomes catherine blake he meets her at the royal academy of art which he attends for a bit in his 20s the couple have no children which is quite unusual for a couple of that time for a married couple um, in 1784, he sets up a print shop with his brother Robert, who then dies in 1787. So the print shop's kind of successful. Um, there's a few famous people that come and hang out in the print shop, but ultimately it's not a success. And Blake is kind of living in poverty for most of his adult life. So he scrapes by, he has a meagre living, which means he doesn't earn very much, but he kind of, he makes it work. Um, his poetry in his lifetime is not widely known. So Wordsworth is kind of aware of him, but really like the reading public, they aren't reading Blake at this time. It's probably because some of his poetry is, as we said, like influenced by this kind of odd religious inner life that he had. And it probably wasn't so popular in his lifetime. But we know that Blake was a really, really intelligent man. So he taught himself in his adult in adulthood, he taught himself Latin and Greek and Hebrew and Italian so that he could read classical texts in their original forms, which is crazy because that is so many languages. So he must have been a really intelligent guy. So that's kind of a snapshot of what was going on in his adult life at the time. But more importantly, you need to think about Blake's sort of personal beliefs and how they influenced his writing and his poetry. So in terms of his politics and his religion, we can describe Blake as a non-conformist. So he didn't conform to the typical political or religious views that some people might have had at the time. So as I said earlier, he hangs out with radical thinkers. So they come to his print shop and pe they're people like Mary Wollstonecraft, who you might have heard of, and Thomas Paine. So Mary Wollstonecraft is a really interesting figure who was kind of an early feminist and she wrote something called Vindication of the Rights of Women in the late 18th century, which is a very famous treatise on women's rights. Um, so he was kind of knocking about with people who had quite radical ideas. Um, he also believes in imagination and inner creativity. So in the 18th century, in which the, the century that Blake was born into, logic and reason kind of win in the day in the 18th century. So there's this movement called the Enlightenment, which prioritises logic and reason above all else. But Blake, he's pushing back against that. He doesn't want to be ruled by logic and reason. He is a man of imagination and inner creativity. So that kind of influences his poetry. And you can see that quite a lot in the, like his artwork and the imagery in his poems, which is very much from his inner mind rather than from logic and reason. Blake is deeply religious. So you can see that from the fact that he has these religious visions as a child, but crucially, he does not approve of the activities of the church. He thinks the church is corrupt and negligent and they're not doing their job. You can really see that coming through in London where he's criticising the conditions that the poor people are living in at the time. So he's very religious, but he dislikes kind of organised religion and that combination of church and state. He doesn't think they're doing a very good job. And moving on from that, he is appalled by the conditions of London's poor. And he often walks around the city to kind of take in the terrible things that are going on. And you can see that the poem London is just an expression of that. His, his kind of um, real 
really being appalled by the conditions of the poor. So that's linked to his kind of disdain for the church and organised religion. Um, similarly, so he doesn't like kind of organised religion. He also, similar to um, our last poet, believed really strongly believed in, in the French in the French Revolution. So at the time when Blake was writing in 1789, the, in France there is a huge political upheaval going on where the peasants are kind of taking control and ridding themselves of their monarchy. They they execute their um, aristocracy using a guillotine and there's this big bloody struggle for the rights of the people. So that's happening all at the time when Blake is writing and it's and it's actually going on when he's writing London and his songs of innocence and experience. So he's going to he's clearly going to be influenced by by the events in France. And he believed, as did many people at the time, nonconformists, that the French Revolution was a sign that the people had more power than they thought they did. And that there was this potential for the people to kind of self actualize and rise up and take control. So you've got the French Revolution going on at the time of writing, so that's a key historical event that would have influenced Blake in his poetry, the French Revolution. But you've also got another revolution going on at the time, which is closer to home, and that is the Industrial revolution and living in London in the late 18th century Blake would have felt the impacts of the industrial revolution really keenly in his life so the industrial revolution as we as you might remember from when we studied a Christmas carol was a kind of social event in the 17th and 18th centuries which saw kind of production in uh, become very much moved from like small cottage industries into huge factories in the cities and there was a big movement of people from the rural areas to urban areas so in a very short space of time people move from working within the home to working in huge factories and living in these very crowded tenements where conditions are really poor and um during Blake's lifetime he gets caught up in something called the Gordon riots which were a reaction to the Industrial Revolution in London. And he's pushed with these rioters from Soho, where he lives, all the way to Newgate Prison. And he kind of gets caught up in this huge frenzy of protest against the impact of the Industrial Revolution. So Blake is clearly influenced by that. And he um, sees the impact of that in London where he's always grown up and lived and sees it as a negative thing so we can see all these images we'll just have a look quickly at the poem so the blackening church the um, mind forged manacles the youthful harlot's curse so Blake's kind of showing us there the negative impacts of the Industrial Revolution in the city of London. So these are our key historical events that may have influenced Blake at the time of writing. So we've got the Gordon Riots, we've got the Industrial Revolution and the French Revolution. And last of all, we're gonna look in a bit more detail at Songs of Innocence and Experience. So this is Blake's, the collection of poetry um, that London is a part of. So initially published as two separate volumes, Songs of Innocence comes first, followed by Songs of Innocence songs of experience they were cut it was kind of intended to show um the two contrary states of the human soul now that is the subtitle of songs of innocence and experience so what that means is it kind of the two collections of poetry represent the unfallen world of innocence and childhood so unfallen kind of means before sin so a world that comes before sin and the fallen world the world of sin and vice and corruption, the world of the church and the state and um, the industrial revolution that Blake saw as such an awful thing and having such a terrible impact on the, the working people. So you've got these two collections of poetry and one represents kind of innocence and 
pre pre sin childhood and the other one represents a world of sin and vice and corruption and kind of after childhood when you've become more experienced and that is how the world looks to you now london was part of the songs of experience so it's part of part of the world which is full of sin and vice and corruption the poems in this collection are simple they reflect kind of the reality of poverty during the industrial revolution and we've said that we can see that in in Blake's London the kind of images that he uses the blood running down the walls of the church and things like that reflecting the reality of poverty and some people have even criticized Blake saying the poems are too simplistic and they kind of reflect um writing for a child but um there are some really powerful images in, in this poem that we will explore in greater detail in in um later in the week so yet yeah, london is part of songs of experience blake writes as a resident of london rather than a visitor so he's very much intimately um aware of the city and how it um what happens within the city on a day-to-day -day basis so he's not writing as somebody who's just come to london and has been impressed by a new experience this is something that he has grown up with and he's really familiar with and he's really thought about how he wants to present London in his poem. And so London, we've talked about this a little bit already, but we'll just say it again. London is critical of the power of the church and state and the social impact of the Industrial Revolution. And we'll explore why and how in more detail later on in the week. Now, you've had a look then at the context of Blake's life and some of the things that were going on in history at the time when he was writing. Now I hope you can see that Blake is a very very interesting character and London is a really fabulous poem. It's very rich in imagery that we'll be looking at um, later on in the week. What I want you to do now is go away and complete task one on your worksheet which is kind of a summary of the context that you've learnt and then a few questions just consolidating what we've talked about today. Thank you very much. Bye.